the foreign emolument, the foreign emoluments clause, Article One, Section Nine, Clause Eight. But therefore, teach out and thus brand Tillman. History. Between the 14th and 18th centuries, it was a routine diplomatic practice for the royalty of a host country to give expensive gifts to departing foreign emissaries or diplomats at the end of their tenure in the host country. Or in the mid 17th century, the Dutch enact the rule forbidding the foreign ministers from taking any president. Any presence, directly or indirectly, in any manner or we whatever. This was motivated by fear for corruption. This new rule was、uh, alien to customary international relations, and was strongly criticized by Abraham D. Wickfarford, one of the most well-known Dutch political writers. Wickfarford. Wickford wrote, "The custom of making a present is so well established that it is of, of gr- as great extent as the law of nations itself. And there is a reason to be surprised at the regulation that has been made on that subject in Holland." Wickford mocked his countrymen for fussing over. Two items like a plate of roots, and accuse them of trying to create a, a republic of Plato in the fens and the marshes. The new rule was too high-minded, abstract. Wickford thought it had, in essence, condemned the sentiments of all the other kings and potentates of the universe. But the new Americans were interested in such high-minded principles, even if they violated the sensibilities of kings and potentates. The Articles of Confederation, American's first national constitution, apparently borrowing from the Dutch, included a provision in Article Six stating, "Nor shall any person holding." Any office or profit or trust under the United States, or any of them, except any present, emulate, uh, emulate, <laughs> emulament, office or title of any kind, whatever, from any king, prince, or foreign state. This clause proved problematic in practice. Foreign powers gifted their departing American emissaries with the same kinds of gifts they have customarily given other diplomats, and the new Americans had to figure out how to square their American man with standard international practice. American diplomats squirmed under two conflicting desires: on the one hand, the desire to please their foreign hosts by accepting the gifts. And on the other, the desire to stay true to the new constitution. Of course, some American diplomats wanted not only to accept the, the gifts but to keep them too. When the King of France gave Benjamin Franklin a very expensive diamond encrusted snuff box, there was、uh, there were some public murmurings, but the Articles Congress ultimately permitted Franklin to keep. To keep the gift. When the Constitution of 1787 was debated and drafted by the Philadelphia Convention, the early draft has no provision akin to the Articles of Confederation's Foreign Emoluments Clause. However, towards the end of the Convention on August 23, 1787, Charles Pinckney. Argue,、uh, urge the necessity of、uh, preserving foreign ministers and other officers of the U.S. of the U.S. independent of external influence. Any move to insert a provision closely tracking the language in the articles 
Ultimately, Pinckney's provision became Article One, Section Nine, Clause Eight. The provision occasioned later other recorded debate. However, in the Virginia Rectifying Commission, Governor Enemold Randolph explained, "This resolution was provided to prevent corruption, an accident which actually happened, operated in producing." The restriction of box was presented to our ambassador by the king of our allies. It was the sort of proper, in order to exclude corruption of foreign influence, to prohibit any one in office from receiving or holding any emoluments from foreign states. Text. As explained, the Constitution's Foreign Emoluments Clause, also known as the Emoluments Clause, Gifts Clause, Foreign Gifts Clause, and the Foreign Titles Clause, was modeled on the Articles of Confederation predecessor. The original Articles of Confederation provision provided, "Nor shall any person holding any office of profit or trust under the United States or any of them accept any present emolument." Office or title of any kind, whatsoever, whatever, from any king, prince, or foreign state. Well, as the Constitution Foreign Emoluments Clause now provides, no person holding any office of profit or trust under them, that is, the United States, shall, without the consent of the Congress, accept of any present emolument. Office or title of any kind, whatever, from any king, prince, or foreign states. This is a modern foreign emoluments clause text departed from its confederation era predecessor in two distinct ways. First, the modern foreign emoluments clause, unlike its predecessor, expressly permitted officers under the United States to accept gifts from foreign governments if those officers. And the consent of the Congress. Some believe that this subclause introduced a substantial change, but others believe it is merely codified the prior practice of the Article Congress. Articles Congress. Second, the Articles Confederation provision apply both offices and profits, offices of profit or trust under the United States, and also to offices of profit or trust under any state. Well, as the Constitution's Foreign Emoluments Clause only apply to offices of profit or trust under them, that is, under the United States, by prevailing with you. The prevailing with you is that the modern Foreign Emoluments Clause, unlike its Article predecessor, does not reach state provisions. The sum would argue that the modern Foreign Emoluments Clause has a somewhat more limited bite or scope. That is Confederation era predecessor. Purpose: American ambassadors stationed abroad are prohibited from act- accepting gifts from foreign governments and their officials. The purpose is to prevent such diplomats from being bribed by foreign luxury and、uh, corrupted by other foreign gifts, and also to ensure. Then the loyalty remains undivided. It is running exclusively to the United States, its government, and its people. Substantial early American materials from the ratification era strongly support this view. Scope. However, the text of the Constitution Foreign Emoluments Clause is not limited to American ambassadors or even to American diplomatic personnel. Instead, the Constitution Foreign Emoluments Clause applies to offices of a profit or trust under the United States a substantially wider category. It is undisputed that this category applies to all officials holding appointed positions in the judicial and executive branches for the national government. What about the legislative branch? In 1792, the Senate asked Secretary of the Treasury Alexander Hamilton to compile a list of all persons holding offices on the United States and their salaries. Hamilton's 1793 response included non-elected officials in each branch, including the legislative branch. The question whether this category is the fourth constitutional foreign emoluments clause 
reaches any or all federal elected positions, that is, representative, senator, vice president, president, and the presidential elector, pose different difficult interpretive, interpretive challenge. For example, Hamilton's list did not include members of Congress or any other elected states or federal position. Likewise, George Washington, while a president, accepted that kept two dominant gifts, but he never asked for or received congressional consent. However, subs- subsequent presidents, such as Andrew Johnson, in similar c- circumstances, sought congressional consent. Whose practice should we rely on? Further implications. The clause is important in its own right, but also for what it might signify about the framers' thinking about corruption. The clause is a solid example and a strong evidence of the radicalism of the framers' anti-corruption commitment, a commitment that、uh, constitutionalized the anti-corruption rule, which flew directly in the face of international convention. Which made diplomacy more difficult for the new republic's officials. This anti-corruption centered understanding of the clause that of the framers' world view might inform our understanding of other constitutional provisions that of the constitution's global structure. But the validity of such interpretations, which rely on, in large part, on framers' intentions rather than specific constitutional text. Is highly controversial. Minor debates. The foreign imminence clause. Let's refer to chat. What is a bribe? What is a gift? In our in one culture, a gift to a public official will be considered a bribe. In another culture, the same gift might be treated as a generous expression of appreciation. Gifts can be one of the best parts of society to create bonds, love, and warmth in a non-transactional way. But gifts can also be dangerous, creating ties that lead to unfairness and preferences instead of equal treatment under the law. Part of the job of building a political society is identifying and separating. That which is corrupt from that which is not corrupt. Society separates sort of corrupt, non-corrupt, different, differently. In short, whether an offering is treated as corrupt, the banned, or generous and valuable, depends on our culture and the political context and on how we write our laws. And the history of the Emolument Clause shows the debate about the difference between which gift. Our corrupt, which gifts are societally valuable, made it into the Constitutional Convention. The early Americans made the radical choice, defying International Convention. The Emolument Clause is remarkable for its stark departure from the European diplomatic culture and the time of our founding. The framers chose to make a commitment to preventing to preventing. Corruption, even though it is complex diplomacy between the fledgling, fledgling United States and the European nations, that choice alone is evidence of the framers' commitment to the independence of its public officials. But when the Emolument Clause alone is considered in the broader context of the Constitution, it becomes evident the Constitution contains within it a structural commitment to fighting corruption. But simply fighting corruption was a central reason for the Constitution. That matters for how we understand the Constitution meaning, and the one clause combined with the dozens of other clauses reflecting a strong anti-corruption principle. Reflect back on each of those clauses on the entire document itself, helping create a lens through which to understand what the best interpretation of the Constitution should be. Just as a car is designed to go forward, and before any effort to understand a piece in the car assumes that a function, the Constitution was designed to combat corruption, and therefore any effort to understand a piece in the document should fit with that function. What is the evidence? 
The nearly 2,000 features of original American Constitution that were designed to combat corruption. These clauses include the veto power designed to limit the corrupting powers of the presidency, the censors designed to keep congressional districts from becoming rotten, the residency requirements for representatives designed to keep rich adventurers from buying congressional seats, and the rules regarding transparency to make sure there was a check on representatives dipping into the public till. One delegate to the Constitutional Convention called the provision to prevent public office from being sold or treated for political power the cornerstone of the Constitution. But also during the con Constitutional Convention and afterwards, the framers talk about corruption more than almost anything. The word corruption is written in his elegant handwriting 54 times Madison's famous notebook from the summer for 1784. The problems corruption and bribery was a hot topic the hot summer. They rose more often than even fashions or violence. As Alexander Hamilton said in the Federal Number 8068, describing the work of writing the Constitution, I think was more to be desired than that every practical obstacle should be opposed to cabal, intrigue, and corruption. Remember, this, this clause alone stands as a somewhat small clause forcing one to sort out gifts and bribes in a particular contest, but when it is placed in the large puzzle of the Constitution, it is a part of a pattern that shows that the American Constitution was designed in order to fight corruption. Next perspective, the Foreign Immigrants Clause reached only appointed officer, officers. By Thesbrand Tillman. In 1966, Congress enacted the Foreign Gifts and Decoration Acts, 5 U.S.C. Clause 7342. The 1966 Act provided elected and appointed officials and employees in the United States government with concrete guidance in regard to receipts of gifts from foreign governments. Although there has been a few exceptional cases primarily related to President Obama's Nobel Prize, the federal employees working for foreign government universities, in general over the last half century there has been little need for the judiciary or others to expound on the Constitution of Foreign Immigrants Clause. There has been little need because in most cases the priority for foreign gifts is now tested by a detailed modern federal stature, stature rather than by the more than 200 years old and obscure foreign immigrant clause. Recently, the foreign immigrant clause has enjoyed a surprise intellectual revival. This revival did not come about in response to a scandal or controversy connected to any specific foreign gifts. Instead, the clause was the heart of a unconcerned intellectual effort. Initiated by two permanent legal academics, Professor Lawrence Linsick and Zephyr Teachout, to rewrite the history of the Philadelphia Convention and our understanding of the framers' original intentions. And the new view has it this clause, in conjunction with other clauses, was a part of the framers' anti corruption project. And the collective these clauses give rise to an implicit structural non textual anti corruption constitutional principle. Other non textual constitutional principles, such as separation powers and federalism, have long been recognized that such principles carry considerable weight, both in judicial decision making and in scholarship. If anti corruption principle has similar weight, which you should recognize, and this principle, according to its intellectual provenance, will permit Congress to regulate contribution to congressional and the presidential election campaigns, notwithstanding competing First Amendment concerns relating to freedom of association and free expression. Indeed, the new scholarship and its focus on the freedom of anti corruption concerns was cited favorably by the four dissenting Supreme Court justices in Citizens United States versus Federal Election Commission, 2010, Stephen G., 
But in his concurrence, Justice Scalia rejected the sentence position in part because the purported anti corruption principle leaves no limit to the government's censorship power. I think the new scholars focus on the framers' deep concern in regard to bribery, divine loyalties, or corruption is entirely correct. The problem for the new scholarship is that the framers' abstract corruption related concerns are not our law. The text of the Constitution is our law. When turning to the Foreign Emirates Clause Office under the United States language, the new scholarship must confront a different interpretive question. Does the Clause Office related language apply to elected federal positions, that is, members of Congress and the presidency? If there are significant gaps within the reach of the clause, that is, if the scope of the clause's office language reaches only appointed, as opposed to elected, federal positions, then it becomes difficult, if not impossible, to make the argument that the newly discovered non-textual non anti-corruption constitution principle founded on this clause and it other similar worded clauses extend or should extend to election position, elected positions. The new scholars' non textual anti corruption principle cannot or not, or not extend beyond actual language clause, particularly where, as here, the framers could have easily added language or use other suitable or more general language, making the foreign eminence clause squarely applicable to some or all elected positions. Traditionally, precedents established by President George Washington's administration carry great weight. President George Washington accepted to keep two diplomatic gifts, but he neither asked for nor received congressional consent. Washington's conduct was widely reported in the press, so it would seem to indicate that he, his administration, Congress, and the public did not believe that the clause applied to the presidency. This interpretation is confirmed by Secretary Hamilton's list. Hamilton was asked by the Senate to produce a financial statement listing all persons holding office under the United States and their salaries. Members of Congress were not on the list, nor was the President. With all due respect to Professor Lindsay and Professor Tichat's revised, more than an understanding of the history and the scope of the Constitution Foreign Emirates Clause, Washington's understanding, Hamilton's understanding, and their 18th century contemporaries' understanding must count for more. Because the original public meaning of the Foreign Emulates Clause never embraced state or federal elected positions. Any non textual anti corruption constitution principle, to the extent one can be inferred from the constitution structure and the framers' intent, cannot or at least should not reach election position, elected positions. Thus, if Congress intends to regulate contributions to federal election campaigns, it cannot rely on the foreign imminent clause as a source of authority to do so.